This video is brought to you by Squarespace. The NFL Draft has finally come and gone, and now that all of these players actually have a team, it's time to really know what they're all about. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about every first round pick, broken down into three separate videos. On your screen now, you can see the grades that I had on each player who was picked in the first round, separated by tier, but I don't want this to revolve around grades, if that makes sense. I will tell you what I thought of each player when I watched them, aside from Cole Strange because I didn't have film on him, thank you Bill Belichick for making everyone's job more difficult, but the function of this project is to help you guys understand what your team is getting in their first round pick. Simple as that. If you have any questions about my grading system or prospects who were picked later than the first round, please feel free to shoot me a DM on Twitter, and I'll do my best to answer every question I can. You're going to hear me reference a lot of stats and measurements in this video, and I'll attach links in the description to sources for that information. Also, those of you who stick around till the end will get a special offer from the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. But if you're just here for your favorite team's pick, head down to the description for timestamps. Let me not waste any more of your time and kick this off with a banger right out of the gate. At first overall, the Jacksonville Jaguars selected Georgia edge defender Trayvon Walker. I'm not going to lie, I did not think this was actually going to happen until about 24 hours before the draft, and even then I wasn't sold. I had a few edge defenders with higher grades than Walker, so I'm not going to say I agree with the pick, but I understand it. In a class of some of the best athletes the NFL has ever seen, Trayvon Walker is at the top of the freak of nature category. At 6'5", 272 pounds, Walker is a monster of a human being, with 35.5 inch arms and a 40 yard dash time of just 4.51 seconds. He owns one of the most impressive combine performances that we've ever seen, but people are really split on him, and I think that has a lot to do with Georgia's defensive structure. Last season, Georgia primarily got pressure on the opposing quarterback by running stunts and blitzes, which is why Walker provided one of the more unique draft evaluations I've ever done. One of the first things you look for in an edge player is pass rush wins. Can they beat the opposing tackle in less than two and a half seconds and get to the quarterback? Do they have a favorite string of moves they use not only to win, but to set up tackles over the course of the game? Usually, these are questions I ask myself when evaluating a pass rusher. But with Walker, you have to take a totally different approach because of the way Georgia's defense was structured. Walker simply wasn't asked to go up and beat an opposing pass rusher very often. He was usually either responsible for containing the quarterback or stunting with one of the other defensive linemen. His arsenal of pass rush moves is underdeveloped, you could even argue that it's totally non-existent, but that has much more to do with his role within Georgia's championship defense than his actual ability. Outside of pure pass rush situations, Walker really thrives in just about every area of the game. He uses his length very well against the run to stack and shed at the point of attack while keeping his eyes in the backfield. He can take on blocks from sifting H-backs or pulling guards better than any other player in this class. And he lined up inside of the tackles on 40% of his snaps in 2021, so he offers alignment versatility as well. I think that there's a little bit too much projection involved with Walker to spend a first overall pick on him, but I expect him to make an immediate impact in run defense, and in time, he could become a well-rounded pass rusher who lines up all over the defensive line. But with that, let's move on to the Detroit Lions at number two overall, who took the local kid, Aiden Hutchinson, edge defender from the University of Michigan. I don't think there was anyone happier to see Trayvon Walker go off the board at number one overall than the Lions front office. Not only do they get arguably the most valuable player in this draft, but also a guy who grew up just outside of Detroit and went to college in Ann Arbor. When you turn on the tape, you can see why Hutchinson was so highly regarded in NFL front offices. The level of refinement he displays as a pass rusher is downright rare. You just don't see guys come into the league looking like this very often. He can win outside, he can win inside, and he can win right through an opposing tackle's chest with a bull rush. He's a big fan of the inside and outside side scissors moves, which have drawn comparisons to all pro edge rushers Nick and Joey Bosa. Tackles have a really hard time getting hands on Hutchinson as he closes in on the quarterback because his twitch and short area quickness are elite, and were confirmed when he tested in the 99th percentile in the three cone drill at the combine. The biggest knock on Hutchinson, and the reason why he is a bit polarizing, is because his arm length is in just the 7th percentile. Arm length is one of the most important measurements in defensive linemen because they need to be able to keep opposing offensive linemen from getting engaged at the point of attack. I personally don't have a huge issue with Hutchinson's arm length because I didn't really see it show up on tape. I thought he did a great job setting the edge in college, and I expect him to be able to do the same at the next level. 
His lower half flexibility is good, but isn't on the level of what we usually see in the top five overall picks. But the bottom line is, Hutchinson is a damn good football player, he's thrilled to be in Detroit, and he'll make a massive impact from the moment he steps on the field. At number three overall, Houston hit us with the first big surprise of the draft by picking Derek Stingley, cornerback, LSU. In 2019, when he was a freshman on that championship LSU defense, Stingley put out some of the most impressive tape I've ever seen. You can tell that he used to play receiver, because when a 50-50 ball was thrown up to Stingley's side, he was coming down with it more often than not. He has the best ball skills of any defensive back I've ever watched, he has the most fluid hips in the class, and he has top-tier recovery speed, when he's healthy. Since 2019, Stingley's level of play has gone down significantly due to a combination of injury trouble and scheme changes. He only played a total of 10 games in 2020 and 2021 combined after playing 15 in 2019. He did struggle against Devontae Smith and Kyle Pitts back in 2019, so I think the notion that he was a true lockdown corner as a freshman is a bit misguided, but he brings a rare skill set to the table. And because of those injuries, we're forced to put a lot of stock into what he did as a freshman. He thrives in press man coverage, but has experience playing off man and zone as well. He's a scheme versatile player who checks all the boxes outside of injury history and immediately fills one of many needs on the Texans roster. At number four overall, the New York Jets selected Ahmad Sauce Gardner, cornerback, Cincinnati. Gardner was mocked to the Jets a lot in the pre-draft process, and I really thought that they would go pass rusher, but I absolutely love this pick. New York knew they had to address defensive back and pass rush early in the draft, and I really like that they went DB first because this class was absolutely loaded with pass rushers, and they took advantage of Jermaine Johnson's fall later in the draft. Those of you who watch my scouting report on Gardner know that I was super high on him going into the draft. I'm not going to get too far into what I saw on tape because I've already covered him in depth, so if you want to know more about him and his game, feel free to check that video out. But like I said, I love the thought process from the Jets front office, I think Joe Douglas absolutely killed it on Thursday, and I hate the fact that my Bills are going to have to go up against this guy twice a year now. But let's move on to the New York Giants, who at 5th overall took Kayvon Thibodeau, edge rusher, Oregon. A year ago, Thibodeau seemed like a lock to be the number one overall pick in this 2022 draft. He was a five-star prospect out of high school and performed very well in his freshman season at Oregon. He has an elite first step and fits the mold of a prototypical edge rusher in the NFL, but his level of play didn't go up as much as we were expecting over the course of his college career. I don't buy the lack of effort claims that have been circling around during the draft process. In fact, I would even call him a high motor player. And I think that the reason he fell to pick five was because the tape just wasn't what we expected it to be considering his resume. That's not to say he isn't a good player. He's a very good player. He just isn't Miles Garrett or Von Miller. For one, Thibodeau's arsenal of pass rush moves is relatively limited. He can go speed to power through a tackle's chest, he'd win to the outside with pure bend, and even to the inside on occasion, but you don't see him rushing the passer with a plan as much as you would like in a top tier pass rusher. The first step explosiveness that Thibodeau displays, however, is downright rare. He gets off the line of scrimmage like a player who's 30 pounds lighter than he is, and get off is the single most important trait in a pass rusher. Traits-wise, Thibodeau checks every box, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if three years from now we look back and say that he should have gone number one overall. With the sixth overall pick, the Carolina Panthers selected Ikemikwanu, offensive tackle, NC State. Whether it was Ikwanu, Evan Neal, or Charles Cross, I thought that at least one of these guys would go in the top five. So Carolina must have felt pretty good when they had their choice of the three because they desperately needed help up front. The best word I can use to describe Ikwanu is bully. He is an absolute pancake machine in the run game, and as one of the more athletic linemen in the class, Ikwanu offers the versatility to thrive in any run scheme. In terms of pass protection, Ikwanu is unrefined but has the tools to thrive down the road. He's really light on his feet, almost to a fault because he tends to overset to the outside. His hand placement is also inconsistent, but once he cleans that up a little bit, he's going to be a really solid pass protector, because once he gets locked into a pass rusher's pads, they are not going anywhere. I'm not sure what a Ben McAdoo offense looks like in 2022, but Iquanu is a versatile player with all the traits, tons of potential, and he immediately fills a gaping hole on Carolina's roster. At number 7 overall, the Giants also addressed their offensive line by picking Evan Neal, offensive tackle, Alabama. Neil is probably the skinniest 340 pound man you'll ever see. He's built like a 6'7 brick wall and moves like a guy who's half his size. 
He's explosive out of his stance. His punch packs some serious power. He has super long arms. I mean, athletically, he checks more than all the boxes. But his technique needs refinement. Neil tends to lean over when he punches, both in pass protection and when he's advancing to an off-ball defender in the run game. It's not surprising that a guy who's 6'7 has balance issues, but this needs to be fixed because, until it is, NFL pass rushers will exploit it. Giants left tackle Andrew Thomas has emerged as a really solid starter, and Neil has extensive experience playing both tackle positions, so I expect him to be a day one starter at right tackle. Brian Dable's offense will probably look like the 2018 and 2019 pre-Josh Allen breakout Bills offense, which, compared to what the Bills offense has looked like since then, is relatively run-heavy. So that'll give Neil some time to develop as a pass protector as the Giants prepare to bring in a young quarterback. Unless, of course, Daniel Jones proves us all wrong. At number 8 overall, Atlanta took Drake London, wide receiver, USC. Do you guys remember when Madden 16 came out and the aggressive catch function was like super broken? That's what it's like watching Drake London's 2021 tape. The guy just comes down with everything. The body control, the hands, the vertical. He has everything it takes to be a monster in contested catch situations at the next level. And that's just a fraction of what he brings to the table. When you turn on the tape, you can tell that London has a basketball background because for a guy who's 6'4", he is super shifty. He's not going to run by corners, but we've seen so many receivers who don't run a 4-4 have great success in the NFL because of everything else they offer. This was one of my favorite picks in the entire first round because now Atlanta can split London out on one side and Kyle Pitts out on the other side, and one of them is guaranteed to have a mismatch. Arthur Smith and the Falcons front office are doing things right because when a rookie quarterback takes over in this offense, whether that's Desmond Ritter or someone else, they're going to be set up to succeed immediately. And the best predictor for quarterback success in the NFL is supporting cast early on. At number 9 overall, Seattle went with Charles Cross, offensive tackle from Mississippi State. How poetic is it that Seattle uses one of the picks they got in exchange for Russell Wilson to draft an elite pass-protecting left tackle? Seattle let pass rushers tee off on Wilson for literally his entire career, and now they decide to spend resources on the offensive line. I found that to be hilarious. Anyway, Cross is a total stud. Playing in Mike Leach's air raid offense at Mississippi State, Cross was asked to pass protect on the vast majority of his snaps, and that's where he thrives. He exudes the phrase, light on his feet. I mean, the guy just glides through his pass sets. His punch timing and placement is about as good as you'll see from a college football player, and his ability to plant and anchor is up there as well. He did get beat inside on jump sets a few times last season, so on those play action passes and one step dropbacks, he's going to need to be a little bit more careful about the depth of his set. People have labeled him as a bad run blocker, but I don't really think that's the case. I think he's inexperienced as a run blocker because for one, Mississippi State only ran the ball about 20% of the time in 2021, and when they did run the ball, the blocking concepts were not nearly as diverse as what he'll see in the NFL. But I think he did fine in what he was asked to do in college, and he has the traits to be a capable blocker on just about any blocking concept at the next level. I was pretty surprised by this pick because if there's anything we know about Pete Carroll, it's that he loves a good run play on 2nd and 10, and that isn't really where Cross thrives, or at least not yet. One way or another, I like the pick because I think Cross is a very good player, and I'm starting to feel like a broken record, but this is a step in the right direction toward preparing for a franchise quarterback to enter the building. And finally, at number 10 overall, the New York Jets selected Garrett Wilson, wide receiver, Ohio State. I'll tell you what, Ohio State receivers coach Brian Hartline deserves a massive raise because they're producing some serious talent at receiver in Columbus. I had slightly higher grades on London and Jamison Williams, but Wilson is a very good player and brings a totally different skill set to the Jets' offense than what London or Williams would have brought. Wilson is a master at creating and taking advantage of the blind spot of an opposing defensive back. DBs lose him in coverage so often because they literally can't see him. In my opinion, he's the best separator in the class, and he offers a true vertical threat with legit 4-4 speed. He also offers alignment versatility, having extensive experience both in the slot and split out wide. So he's a guy who can do pretty much whatever you ask of him. He isn't the physically dominating Alpha X type like Drake London, but he can win off the line against press coverage. I think pairing Wilson with Elijah Moore is a big positive step toward getting Zach Wilson the supporting cast he needs to break out. Before I go, I'd like to share a word from the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. 
If you have a business or are interested in starting one, Squarespace is a phenomenal resource for building your online presence. It's an all-in-one platform that can help you get your brand off the ground or take your business to the next level by building a website. What you see on your screen now is the site I created for my brand, and this was all done in under two hours. It's a really user-friendly service and offers tons of tools that can help you do whatever it is you want to do with a website. Personally, for now, I'm using it as a gallery to showcase my work on YouTube, so on the homepage, you can see my recent videos. Squarespace also offers an email marketing service, and it provides a platform to sell a product. Whatever you want to do to grow your brand, and wherever you are in the process, Squarespace has a service for you. So check out squarespace.com for a free 14-day trial. Then, when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash billystevens to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Again, that's squarespace.com slash billystevens for 10% off your first purchase. But that's going to do it for part one of this three-part series. If you'd like to support the channel, you can check out my Patreon and Twitter at the links in the description. But that's all I've got for now, so until next time. Later.